Greetings everybody, it's a great blessing for me to come to you today and today we're going to talk about the love of God uh, just a simple message from Ephesians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 5 but I trust that it will impact you in a very very big way let us just uh, pray together as we start the service Father I want to thank you for your grace and your love thank you for the way wherein you care for this world thank you that you love us and thank you that we can look at the resurrected Jesus Christ. And as we look at what's going on in the world, we know that that is things we see, but that is not what we focus on. We focus on you, the one that was raised from the dead, the Lord. And thank you for the life that you give us, the peace that you give us, the righteousness that you give us, and the uh, life that is free from fear of death. Thank you for what you do. Spirit of God, Thank you that you speak powerfully through me, bringing the message of life today. Amen. Today I'm going to speak from Ephesians 3, but just before that I want to just bring a short encouragement from 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 as pertaining to, um, to death. We've had a, a good friend, Shannon Orr, that passed away and many of you uh, have known her and when somebody that we love passed away, we are just... Uh, again confronted with life after death and all of that and i want to just bring you an encouragement from the bible and the way paul dealt with this and i trust that you guys will find great encouragement uh, shannon was a good friend she came here with the ladies of grace or the woman of grace and preached the gospel here in south africa um, it was just an awesome time uh, here and also just to know her as a friend I am very grateful towards her. She was the person that the Lord has used to bring me in connection with Connie Witter and everybody in the Tulsa area. Uh, and I'm just grateful, very grateful for her life, the love that she has for God and the way wherein she spoke and shared that with such a kindness and tenderness and a brokenness of heart, open, open heart. Um, she had such a beautiful voice. It was just awesome to have known her. And uh, I want to just express my gratitude to, towards just the way she has loved on Helena and I. And the respect that she had for both of us was absolutely awesome. Uh, okay, I want to just share this verse. It says in First Thess Thessalonians 4 verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, <clears throat> even so, them also which sleep in Christ or has died as believers, will God bring with him. And he's now referring to the resurrection. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or the right word there is precede, them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds or in the glorification to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, and <clears throat> um, Paul clearly states here that we should comfort one another with these words what words the words that jesus died and that he rose again and that those who has died as believers in jesus in the day that jesus christ shall return they shall also be bodily raised from the dead what i find uh, paul focuses on here is not life after death but the life after the life after death that is what he focuses on anti right words it that way and i I find um, a lot of logic or a lot of understanding in the way that he words it. He says that you, you live and you die and then we, after we have died, we call it life after death. And then there is the resurrection 
which is the life after the life after death. And that is what Paul focuses on. And I do believe that the reason why he focuses on that is because there's only true comfort for the human heart inside this logic and inside the truth of the resurrection. I remember when my mom died uh, and uh, I went and I saw her lifeless body. Um, the only thing that could comfort me was that she would be raised from the dead. That is what brings true comfort because I, th I think it is the very same way with the disciples. Jesus, when he died, he said, Father, into your hands I give, I commit my spirit. Even the same with Stephen at his stoning. He says, Father, receive my spirit. Uh, but we find that the people still mourned and they were, they were discouraged at the death of Jesus. When they saw Jesus die, even if he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, there was still a sadness because in the human heart, there's a certain injustice that is being done towards a human as pertaining to the body, uh, if the body has died. But we find that when Jesus was raised from the dead, never to die again, that the very same people that was mourning, even after they heard Jesus saying, into your hands I commit my spirit, um, they found true joy. And I have found this in my life is when I... Um, when I look at the true justification, not the partial, partial justification where we can say our spirit is in the hands of the Father, but where we can look in the true justification, the reason why Jesus Christ has died. When we look at that uh, uh, and why he was raised, the reason why he was raised is so that we can be justified in the flesh with eternal life. And I want to say to you that uh, the Apostle Paul says here with these words, what words? That Jesus will return, that those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ shall not precede those who have slept in the Lord, uh, who have died in Jesus Christ, as pertaining to the glorified body. But Jesus will return, those who have died will at his return be raised from the dead, and then we who believe in him shall then be changed. So we don't have to think that death has conquered those that has, um, that has died before the return of Jesus. And it seems to me as if that was an issue in the time here. So um, the injustice that we look at when we see a human body die, when we look at Shannon and she got cancer and she passed away, uh, when we look at that, even if we would have the thought that her spirit is in the hands of God, we, there's still something inside us that say, yes, we are happy, but true joy can only be found in the full restoration of the human body. I want to just say that is where I found, where I find my comfort and I think that when somebody has passed away, um, you know, and we think of the afterlife, let us not lose out of sight the absolute importance of the bodily resurrection. Uh, no person would be fully complete outside of the restoration of the human body unto full eternal life. In the very same way as what Jesus would not have been complete should he have died and just said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit, and his body stayed in the grave. It would have been a defeat. It would not have been called a victory. So we can know that Jesus was raised. It is a historic fact. We even now have the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of God, the spirit of life, wherewith we are sealed unto the day of redemption, according to Romans chapter 8, which is the redemption of our bodies unto the adoption of eternal life. Uh, church, I've just found that anything that's in the scripture that is so clear, as we meditate and ponder upon that truth, it just yields the peaceable fruit of his life. We have peace in our hearts. And to Shannon's family, 
uh, and her friends, friends that will definitely watch this. I want to encourage you and I want to say to you that, yes, we do mourn because we, we miss her. You know, I, I think of her beautiful smile. I think of just how she would, when she gets a, a, a deeper understanding of the goodness of God, how easily the tears would flow of gratitude. Uh, just who she was as a, per as a person. When she was here in South Africa, um, they were, I could have gone to any of the ladies where they were preaching. I wasn't preaching that Sunday, but I chose to go with her, Elena and I, because um, I just enjoy her ministry so much. And I just thought, let me just go there. And never thinking that it would be the, the last message that I would sit in a service where she would be uh, would, would preach. I want to encourage all of you that the restoration of Jesus Christ is not partial. Completeness, wholeness is in what we have seen, you know, in the resurrected Jesus. And that is what salvation is all about. And we will find Jesus Christ returned to this earth. We're not living on this earth for no reason. God has a dream with us on this earth. And, and, and each one that has believed upon him shall be raised bodily. This is what the Bible says, that what the mind could not have thought about, what is above what we could ever ask or think, God has prepared for us who love him. So be encouraged. I would like to pray for, for you. Father, I want to thank you that we can right now pray for uh, Shannon's family as well as all of her friends, people that have known her. I thank you, Lord, that you come and you encourage us with a knowledge of the resurrection. Thank you that you heal their hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you give them wisdom in how to handle this in these times by focusing on the finished work of Christ. And Lord, your work wasn't finished on the cross. Your work was finished when you ra were raised and ascended on high. And that, and from there, we will see completion manifest in us. Thank you for the finished work as pertaining to the atonement plan, which is the ascension. Thank you that we from there can behold this life and those that have uh, passed away who has died, who has, as Paul said, fallen asleep. Thank you, Lord, that we can never give in to death. The, the closest we can ever come to death is just to say it is a, a sleep. A person that sleeps is, is alive. And thank you, Lord, that you have come to give us eternal life, that you will wake us up out of the grave. Thank you, Father, that every person that hears this can be comforted with the words of eternal life. Amen. Amen. Right, let us get right into the message. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3. Now, uh, as I read this this week and studied this out, but it seems to me as if the Apostle Paul was in a difficult situation. The Jewish Jews and Gentiles were persecuting people in Ephesus and the persecution that they were placing on them was basically saying that the more you believe in Jesus, the more we're going to punish Paul. And basically also worked out that way. The more the church was growing and the more churches was planted, the more upset people would get because they would think this Paul that is now that we have in jail here, he is actually indirectly um, responsible for the growing of the church and for the church even being there. Because we must remember that they believe that Jesus died um, and that he was buried or some would even believe that he was buried. Some would say that there wasn't, it wasn't a tradition to bury people that was crucified. Their bodies got thrown in a ditch there and the dogs and the ravens ate them. They didn't have the privilege to be crucified, which is not a, a historic fact. The, if you go and read the old Roman laws, you find that there was an op uh, opportunity. It was like a side little law kind of a thing, but there was an opportunity for people that was crucified to be buried. And, um, but these people didn't, some of them didn't even believe that Jesus was buried. They didn't even believe that he died for anyone or anything. They believed he was a criminal. He never was raised from the dead. And now they find uproar in certain places and, and kind of a violence, not because of the church or not through the church, but there were people that for political reasons didn't like the church. 
and also didn't like that they come and now say that this man is actually the son of God or God incarnate and that he is the Lord, meaning he is the ruler over Rome and the ruler over all other gods and so forth. We, now, we need to understand that the Roman Empire tried to have peace between different religions. And if one religion come and they say that our God is the God over all the other gods, immediately it causes turmoil and tension and strife. And that was basically what was preached. And uh, Paul was now going through even more difficult times as the church in Ephesus was believing upon or the church. Yeah, the, 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 the church in Ephesus as they were uh, believing. And as Paul was writing from jail to the Ephesians, he said, listen, don't stop to believe because I'm suffering. Continue in your faith. And then he prayed and he says, I pray that Christ may uh, strengthen you. So, um, and let us just uh, pick it up from there. I just want to get the, the right version here. Ephesians chapter 3. This is Paul, Paul's prayer. Um, he says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So let's go to verse 16. He says, I pray that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. I think the strengthened with might there contextually is about uh, that you will be strengthened to continue in the gospel, although I and other Christians are being persecuted for the gospel and he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth the length the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God so what Paul is basically saying here is that, yes, you are believing in Jesus, but my prayer is not that you stand a little bit back and like make, make it just a private thing. But I want your minds to expand, your thoughts to expand as pertaining to the gospel. I want you to comprehend the word comprehend, catalambano, which means to, to grab a hold of and make use and experience this this knowledge of Christ or this love that you are in. So I want to just focus on that love, the love of God. Because Paul comes and he basically says here that I want you to comprehend with all the saints what is the dimensions of this love. And should you refer that back to chapter 1, it's basically saying, I want you to know the love of God as pertaining to the effect it will have on your life now and what it holds for us in the future. And the conclusion that he comes to here is that as we see these dimensions of the love of God that uh, passes all knowledge, that we will be filled with the fullness of God. So the fullness of God is connected towards the love of God. The love of God that there is in Christ is something specific. It is more than just an emotion. It is more than just a feeling, although it all starts there. It starts with a heart that has got compassion on people that's going through difficult times. You know, you might be watching this and go through a difficult time. This morning I preached to our local congregation via a Zoom meeting, and, um, and I, I know there are people that are in our congregation where people have lost their salaries, some people lose their jobs, other people lost their businesses on account of this coronavirus and what is going on in the world. And as people are uh, sitting at home and don't have a job and also have travel restrictions on them and everything because of the COVID-19, they are bombarded uh, with news of, uh, you know, r racial tension and all those kind of things. And, uh, you know, everything that politics holds. And it brings a person to a place where your heart really feels desperate for life. And I felt this week to just preach this message on the love of God, wherein Paul says that as we understand the love of God, we will be flooded with the fullness of God. So the love of God is directly connected with the fullness of God. And I also believe that, as the scripture says, and um, let me just quickly find that I, I didn't 
um, plan to to read this this but let me quickly find it here this is in proverbs 4 verse 18 it says but the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day so as we understand the love of god and we are being justified in our belief in jesus christ we are justified with a brighter and brighter shining forth and experiential knowledge of the love that god has for us in things like the fruit of the spirit and peace and removing of fear and also knowledge in how to handle difficult situations so as an introduction what paul is saying here he says i don't want you to be afraid of uh, having your mind exercised and expanded and your knowledge greater and I, I don't want you to be ashamed of making use of Jesus, although it might make life a bit more difficult for me in jail. Because as people see what you are doing and threatening you, saying, listen, if you continue with this, we're just going to kill Paul. Uh, you know, don't be afraid of that. Continue in your revelation of how much God has loved you. Grab a hold of these things. My prayer is that you will see the dimensions, how high, how wide, how deep. And how long? You find the three dimensions with an eternal time aspect connection, connected to that, like a four-dimensional thing there. I want you to, to grab a hold of this because as you grab a hold of this and believe upon this, it is called just. And you will find that this light shines brighter and brighter and brighter even until the day of the Lord, that full and perfect day when we see, as I've said earlier in this message, uh, encouraging people as pertaining to those that have slept in Christ, that day of the resurrection. So it's almost as if I'm saying that, and what Paul is saying here, that the love of God manifests now what will be in the future as we understand that, and, and to the, the measure that we understand that in a greater way in us here. So it's very important to understand the love of God. From that we can extrapolate the following. That to the measure wherein we grab a hold of how much God loves us and what this love means, we will experience God in our lives. We can also say that in the area wherein we are not seeing victory in our lives, we can say that's the area wherein we need to understand more of the love of God towards us. As long as what I see shortcomings in my life now, I just say that to me just says there's more to understand about God's love for you. It is not a message of condemnation anymore, but a message of there's more good for you. There, have your heart even enlarged to see and, and believe on the love of God. Very practical, if I... If, if something in my life happens which I don't want to happen or if I uh, live in a way that I feel is not right, I don't go and beat myself over the head from the morning until evening. All I'm saying is, well, God, obviously there is more of your love that I need to know and understand. And I am absolutely open for that. And from there, I will just see more of your fruit manifest in my life. Uh, if you sit with fear anxiety as pertaining to finances and your business and the future and all those kind of things the, the the scripture says when it comes to money don't you know that you have a heavenly father that cares for you and what he basically says is all of our anxiety as pertaining to finances and all those kind of things can be directly linked to knowing we have a heavenly father that cares for us so how i get rid of fear as pertaining to the future politically um you know money and all those kind of things is by going and sitting down and saying father i want to just from your scripture and from you convincing my heart just want to see how you are a father that cares for me look at the birds of the air you know they not, don't sow or reap or gather into bonds the lilies of the field don't possess bonds they don't toil do any of those things they've got basically nothing that they have built up for themselves in this world that they can fall back unto but you care for them you care for them and i want to know that as you care for the birds i am of greater worth and i also want to know your love for me 
Because that is what the, how the provision of God works. The provision of God is not a works provision, but a worth provision. Scripture says, are you not worth more than the birds and the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is gone? What he's saying is, is that God has come th through the Father and granted eternal life unto us, where we can exist forever with God. And from that perspective, he is saying, look how God cares for you. If that is, you are worth more than the birds. You are worth more than the grass of the field, which got a beautiful flower today and is gone tomorrow. And what Jesus is saying, as you know this, you will find that works and fear, all plans and uh, uh, um, whatever th thing we think we need to do to try and secure a future for us, or you know, another way of saying it is making a living, as we try to make a living, it will all fall away in knowing we are offered life or offered a living, uh, but a eternal living. Glory to God. So when we look at the word love, and many of you have heard me preach this before. I just see that my, okay, I want the dictionary here. Um, many of you heard me use this definition from Webster's over and over. I want to just go back to it because every time I read it, it just takes my breath away. It is so beautiful to look at this definition of what love is and then to see how God loves us. Definition of love, and we're connecting it to Ephesians 3, where it says that we can understand how deep, how high, how wide, and how long the love of God is. Um, the definition of love is something that can be applied in everyday life. And to think that God lives that way towards us is just mind-blowing. Here it is. Love is an affection of the mind. It's an affection of the mind excited by beauty and worth of any kind. Okay, so if, if we say that God loves us, we have to say that we have got an effect and it brings affection to the mind of God. And it is not just excited by God just being good in the sense of saying, I've got no reason to do anything for these people. No, it talks about the value that is looked at. So when we say that God loves us and we want to study the dimensions of the love of God and what it means, I think it's very good to start with the basic definition of what love is and then link it into the actions of love that Jesus, Jesus and the Father has in preserving our lives forever. It's an affection of the mind that is excited by beholding beauty and worth of any kind that is what it is about so we find that the mind of god got excited or made alive if you want to call it like that or it was put into action why because of god beholding our beauty and our worth it's also excited by the qualities of an object which communicate pleasure be it sensually or intellectually so what it says is, is that we as humans communicate pleasure to God intellectually. We know it's not an essential way here. And the definition is also being used towards people and couples and all those kind of things. But we stimulate God intellectually. We, bring, we affect his mind and excite him because when he beholds us, he sees beauty, he sees worth, he sees qualities that communicates pleasure to him and excites him even intellectually that is amazing so when god is looking at you he saw beauty he saw somebody that's very beautiful somebody that brings him pleasure somebody or a being that has got qualities that stimulates him intellectually and this person is lost or this person is being oppressed by death and everything that surrounds death and leads unto death. So when God beholds you and as we study these scriptures, you know, we have to come to a place where we say, God, how do you see me? 
And when God beholds us, and as we tap into how he sees us, we have to know that there is a strong emotional component to this, wherein God feels emotion, wherein God feels compassion, wherein God feels empathy from where he's moved over into actions which can preserve our lives forever. As you behold your child that might be lost, some of us, we have children that might be lost, don't believe in Jesus and are out um, you know, in the world on drugs and don't want anything to do with you or any of that. As you behold that child, you, it is impossible not to feel a compassion. It is impossible not to behold value and beauty because that person is part of you. You had a dream for that person. And as you behold that person, you've got a compassion. And maybe some of us, we have come to the end of ourselves where we, we don't know what to do anymore. But we have a God that is more powerful than us. And as we behold that person, God, in the very same way, and even in a more powerful way, because he's got a better revelation of who that person is, he is moved in his inner being to bring that person unto life. He doesn't behold and look at a person that is lost and say, I rejoice in the death of the unrighteous. No, he does not. He, the, the heart of God is salvation. Why? Because he loves people. And as we behold our loved ones that might not be believers or might be atheists, that might even be against Christianity, but we've got something inside our hearts that wants them to have life, that wants, we want their lives to be preserved forever. How much more, not God? And here we find that Paul comes and he says, I want you to have your heart enlarged. I want you to be strengthened to continue to understand what this love of Christ is all about. It is about the fullness of God manifesting in us bodily and he clearly says that as we understand the dimensions of God and grab a hold of it at the, the end of that is to be flooded with the fullness of God you cannot be filled with the fullness of God through the works of the law you cannot be filled with the fullness of God by doing 10 steps and trying to have a breakthrough you cannot you cannot have the fullness of God by prospering financially or even your generosity you cannot have the fullness of God by bodily health not at all the fullness of God or by your exercise or any of that the fullness of God according to Paul here is only accessed by catalambano meaning grabbing a hold of the love of God knowing comprehending you know by grabbing and understanding what this love means and as we grab a hold of the love of God we are filled with the fullness of God and I can testify about that what fills me today fills me with fruit of the spirit also fills me in emotionally and intellectually is the thought of God looking at me as we have read here and seeing beauty and worth and qualities which um, which communicates pleasure and that stimulates him even intellectually that is th that touches my heart it it just brings this absolute fulfillment to me and that is the same for you so I want to encourage you in the simple message today as you go, and I want to say this to old and young, and especially for young people, if there's some young people watching this with your parents or you're just watching this on your own, your mom and dad cannot fill your emotional tank for you. Your mom and dad cannot uh, bring you to a place where you feel fully satisfied no iPhone or iPad or friends can stimulate you in a way wherein you feel full and satisfied only the love of God can do that and the way you access that is not just by listening to a message or any of those things the way you're going to access that is to say, well, I see mom and dad are believing in Jesus, but I'm going right now and 
or whenever you feel like it, into my room or a place where you're alone or just even in the car, doesn't matter, where you maybe sit in the back and mom and dad's driving the car, where you just have that moment where you say to God, God, here am I, it's just me and you. I want to know your love. I want you to reveal yourself to me. And as you do that, you will find in the time to come after that, God, in a way only he knows how to, start to reveal and speak to you about his goodness, about his kindness, about his faithfulness towards you as well as your value. And I find that my heart is not full because I find how valuable I am. I find that my heart is full on how the God that is above all value, uh, above everything that we can ever think or dream, is in love with me and how he has come and done everything to preserve my life forever. When we look at the love of God in Jesus Christ, the Bible says in John 3, it says that he gave his son so that we will not perish but have everlasting life. So the love of God is basically expressed in, and I want to just use a normal word here that we can kind of understand, in longevity. Meaning, we, as we as humans love somebody and we don't want him to die because we want him with us. As I said in the beginning of this message about Shannon Orr, you know, we, we want her to live long. We want her to become a hundred years or as long as what we live. At least, you know, we want her to live long. We want her with us. We don't want her to die. We want her to live. The very same uh, chain of thought is used when the Bible talks about the love of God. Humans as mortals die. And God knew the only way he can preserve our lives forever is if he could conquer physical death so that humans bodily can live forever. And that is what he did in Jesus when he raised him from the dead. So as we are thinking on the love of God and how it was expressed, we find that God looks at man and says, I don't want them for 10 or 20 or 50 years or 100 or 120 years where I can communicate and, and be with them. I want them forever. I want them forever. Therefore, he comes and he conquers that which would take us out of life, which is mortality. And we find that that is wherein the love of God is expressed. He, the word became flesh and lived amongst us. The Jesus Christ entered death, conquered death, and now offers eternal life or longevity that can never end. Very long. <laughs> and he gives it to us for he forever wants to be with us. The beautiful thing about God and what he did in getting this right is that the word or the what we call the son of God, one of the persons in the Godhead, had to put on flesh. And as the son put on flesh, the word was incarnated into uh, flesh and died and was then raised. He was raised with human flesh, meaning that he can never change from that. Jesus will forever have a physical body and there's a beautiful scripture and we're going to go into that now which says that a man will leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife for they are one flesh for the wife is flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and in the very same way jesus with a heavenly uh, with a physical body body that is in heaven now will leave his father's house and cleave unto his wife and return to this earth to forever be with us and he now through the power of conquering sin and death is cleaning us and beautifying us with the words of eternal life and there will be a day where he will come back but we also find that the father will not abandon him or us that we will be under the rulership of his father and we will find that God will be all in Jesus and all 
in us. And so we will be one with him. It is a love story that is not just a story. It is a reality. It is a truth. It is the truth whereby we are saved. So, okay, I want us to quickly go to Ephesians, and I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. This is very, very powerful. Ephesians 5, and I'm going to read from verse 22 in the Message. Talks a bit about marriage here, but that's not, that's not what we're going to focus on. It says, Wives, wives understand and support your husbands in ways that shows your support for Christ. That word, I like to translate it here. He used the word support interchangeably with the word submission, uh, which is very beautiful. It just gives a, a beautiful and a different perspective on what submission is. It means to, to stand for that and to be with the husband, to support the husband in what he does, uh, instead of just domineering. It says, the husband provides leadership to the wife the way Christ does to the church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So the way Christ leads us is by cherishing us. The way he leads us is by cherishing us. Uh, the love of God leads us. As we start to see how God cherishes us and how his way of cherishing is defined in how he would go literally over land and sea come hell or high water we would say doesn't matter what it is he would go through that to preserve our lives forever as we see that God has got he doesn't want any part of us to perish he wa wants us as a complete human to be fully preserved forever and as a baby is born um, we, what brings us joy is not the, um, the, the whole concept of a, a spirit is now given to a body. That is not what brings us joy when a baby is born. When a baby is born and presented to the mom, we find that what is presented to to the mom is a complete little human being and we are happy for this life we say look at the life and that is what God sees when we are born and he says I cherish that life and I will preserve that life forevermore that's why he became a human and as he became a human, he says that he will be raised up into immortal human flesh and so have the rule over uh, um, humans and so preserve our life or the life of God in us forever. That is what it is all about. Okay, so um, let me read this again. It says, husband provide, the husband provides leadership to the wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So God wants to cherish us. He cherishes our lives. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to verse 24. And as we understand this cherishing, we are led by him. We are led by him in the, I want to say, in the dimension where we know he cherishes us cherishes us on how to treat people, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, how to run our businesses and all those kind of things. It is born from this cherishing amen verse 25 husbands go uh, verse 24 so just as the church submits to christ as he exercises such leadership a leadership not domineering or but by cherishing so we can say so just as the church submits to christ as he leads us by cherishing us wives should likewise submit to their own husbands you now we need to submit to god's cherishing of us how did he cherish us? He cherished us by saying, I give you eternal life as a free gift. He cherishes us by saying, I provide you peace and joy, not by your own works, but by conquering physical death and offering you eternal life as a free gift. Now, we submit to that. We look at that and we say, thank you, Lord. And we dig into that. We delve into that. And we say, we want to understand that. That is how we are submitting to his cherishing. Okay, it says here that husbands go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving and not getting. 
How does God lead you? How, how are we led by God? By looking at what He gives us. What did He give us? He gave us the only begotten Son. What is the only, and I, I use the word what here and not who, what is the only begotten Son? The only begotten Son is the firstborn from physical death. And what He gives us, the love that He gives, is marked by what He gave. What did He give? He gave unto us a resurrected, glorified human Jesus, who He then appointed as Lord over sin and death in our lives, leading us, and He gave Him as the aid and the help and the ruler, bringing us to the fullness of God. That's what He gave us. And as He gave us this gift, let us study this gift out. Let us see what the dimensions of this gift is. You know, many times we find, and I've seen that before, somebody gives a gift, and it's in a packet, and it's not even opened. And when it's opened, and let's say it was a cell phone, you can take the phone, switch it on, and say, well, it can make calls. But what about exploring the dimensions of that gift? What can that gift do? It can take pictures. It can serve the internet. It can uh, uh, get emails. You know, it can be used as a roadmap, a GPS. I mean, there's so many things you can use it for. It can be used. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you can just think of the dimensions of what you can use a cell phone for, a cell phone for these days. In the very same way, as we are being led, and this is how God leads us. He leads us by giving something to us. And what he gave us is Jesus. Let us study out the dimensions of what it means when he gave us a, uh, a resurrected Jesus, a only begotten son that we will not perish but also have eternal life. Preserving, see that just newborn baby, preserving the life of that baby. If I say to you, we want to preserve the life of a baby, are you saying, well, we need to see just how this baby spirit can go to heaven? Or when I say, let's preserve the life of that baby, are you thinking of it as pertaining to having that baby not die and live as a human? Oh, that's what we think. That's the natural thing we think. And that is what God thinks when that baby gets born. That's what God thought when you were born. And that was his plan from the beginning. It says here, husband, go out all, uh, all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving and not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. Maybe you're not feeling whole today. The only thing that can make you whole and it will make us whole to the point that even bodily we will be whole to never die. But emotionally, let's talk emotionally. What makes you whole as pertaining to your view of the future, as pertaining to your relationship with your husband and wife and children and family and friends and business and so forth, what makes you whole as a preacher is the love of Christ. Christ's love, the Messiah and what he's come to do for us. And the standing and grabbing a hold of that makes us whole. His words, and the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, in these last days he's spoken to us through the resurrected son, who after he has washed away all our sins, went and sat down at the right hand of majesty. Now he speaks to us through that son. Those words evokes our beauty. As we understand what God is saying, through the resurrected Jesus. So many times we want to say, what does God say? And we open the Old Testament and we want to read. Or we want to say, what does God say? And we open the writings of Paul and we want to read. Yes, we can see what God says through that. But the voice doesn't start in the Old Testament. The voice doesn't start in the New Testament or the writings of Paul. The voice of God to you starts at the revelation of the resurrected Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Everything Paul could ever have said, everything any of the Old Testament prophets or writers could ever have said, is all taken together and fully expressed in intent, in meaning, in full expression, in the resurrected Jesus. Who he is, 
And what he is and what it promises is what God says about you as pertaining to your value, your future, on why you are here, on why this earth is here, and all those things. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words, the message of eternal life, evokes beauty in us. In other words, he sees the beauty, but he's now bringing forth that beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of us. Dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. God dresses us through Christ in dazzling white silk, expressing our holiness, our beauty, and our value in what he did in Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to hear all the time from him. And that is how a husband ought to love their wives. They are doing themselves a favor since they are already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, God's not going to abuse you because if Jesus abuses you and speaks bad about you and all times say how ugly you are and everything they do and, and abuses you as a servant, a slave. I mean, that, that would be like abusing your own wife. And it says here, it would be abusing your own body. If we look at people today that abuses their own bodies and, and uh, you know, do self-mutilation and all those kind of things, what we say is there's something wrong. That person needs help. And Jesus is not going to do that. He's not going to do that. He's not going to harm his own body. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. And that's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body Listen to this, and this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. They no longer two, they became one flesh. So, as long as what Jesus is in heaven and we are on earth, it is at a place where Jesus will say, my body, now he does have a physical body, but my kind, <laughs> my people, are in this earth and I want to bring them to me and I want to go to him. That's why as he is coming to the earth, we will meet him in the air or we will meet him in that glory, glorified body. And that's where we will meet him as he comes to the earth to live with us forevermore. And the narrative that Paul is using here, the dynamic that he's using here is of a man leaving father and mother, cleaving unto his wife and starting a family there. Why? Because they are one, one body. The King James says that we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. That is what it is expressing, saying that we are one with him, saying that he is coming to us. That is absolute love language. The Bible says that Jesus was given unto the church. It's marital language of prearranged marriage. If Jesus was given to the church, it was like me saying, I give my son to some, somebody's daughter. And that person say, I give my daughter to your son. And they will be one flesh and have a family of their own. In the very same way, the father said, as a father, I give my son to the church which is you, that we can be one flesh with Jesus. And as Jesus became mortal flesh and now was glorified to have immortal flesh, never to die, and we are one flesh with him, it means we've got the hope of eternal life bodily. And that is how he is preserving us forevermore. Isn't that absolute good news? There's much that I can still say about this, but I think that this is... Enough to encourage you in the good news of Jesus. What you can go and do after listening to this message, say, God, this message has encouraged me. And maybe now I'm going to have a meal and eat something and cook some food. And now then we're going to have a meal and take a nap and all those kind of things. And what you normally do on a Sunday. Do all of that. But I want to encourage you. Take time where you just sit alone. Each one of you, young and old, children, parents, anybody, and say, God, I heard what Bertie preached, but I want to know more of that for myself. Here am I. Thank you that you speak to me. Maybe you will not hear a voice or something. It might just be that which you speak to God, and that is the end of it. 
and then you just continue. But from that sincerity, speak that to God, go to God, and you will find how he continues, and in a greater way, as we continually have that relationship with God, reveals his love for you and floods you with his fullness. As that scripture says, the just is like a light that, that arrives in the morning and then at noonday we find the fullness of the glory of that day. And that is how our justice will be and how the life of the just would be as we are hearing the love of God. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much that I can come right now and pray for everybody that is watching. Thank you that you flood us with your goodness and your love and your kindness. Thank you that we can sit here today and I can say, just in front of everybody here, I can say, Lord, I just want to know the depths of your love. I want to understand the hope of your calling. I want to understand what you've inherited in us. I want to just see how all of this works and I want to see the dimensions of that. I want to understand your kingdom in a very deep way. Thank you for the depths where I can understand it. But I want to just say my mind and my heart is open for your fullness. Father, as I pray this, I think of people watching here. I thank you they are encouraged by this word and that they will just see more and more of what you have done in them just happen over and over and over and how they are washed by the word of the resurrection how they are washed by the word of your acceptance and love for them as you behold their beauty and value and as that excites pleasing thoughts of acceptance and kindness and it excites you even intellectually and stimulates you to the point that you say, let me preserve them forever. Father, as much as what you are our destination, we find that your destination was also to be with us. It is mind-boggling. Thank you for your love, O oh God. Amen and amen. Thank you so much that I could serve you today. And then I will see you again in this week as I will upload messages on Facebook. God bless.